Good morning. This is Rob Moffat, Vice President of Corporate Development and Investor Relations at Innoviz, and I want to welcome you to our earnings conference call. Joining us today are Omer Kalef, Chief Executive Officer, and Elder Segla, Chief Financial Officer. Following their opening remarks, we will open the call to your questions. I would like to remind everyone that this call is being recorded and will be available on the Investor Relations section of our website at ir.innoviz.tech. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that our discussion today will include forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties relating to future events and the future financial performance of Innovis. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements made today speak only to our expectations as of today, and we undertake no obligation to publicly update or revise them. For discussion of some important risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from any forward-looking statements, please see the risk factors section of our Form 20F filed with the SEC on March 9th, 2023. I will now turn the call over to Omer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rob, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Before we begin our business commentary, I wanted to spend a moment on the situation in Israel. The safety and security of our employees is of the utmost importance. And I can report that everyone at Innovis is safe. With a small portion of the local workforce serving in the reserves, the rest of our team has stepped up to cover what is needed. And I want to thank them for their incredible fortitude at this challenging time. Innovis was able to remain open with no meaningful operational impact. As a reminder, we are located in the center of the country, a good distance away from the conflict zone. All of our automotive customers are located outside of Israel, and our high-volume manufacturing sites are in the United States and Germany, with a third plan for Asia. Determined to not let the situation slow us down, during the week of the attack, we achieved an important milestone on time, delivering the final SOP version of the perception software of the BMW 7 Series launch. We worked closely with the teams at Magna and BMW to complete testing and lock the final version of the software that will be installed on the vehicles in the coming weeks. Since then, we've also delivered on milestones for the Volkswagen Group program and the BMW Gen 2 program, all while managing audits, testing and negotiating with multiple OEMs in our RFQ pipeline, and staying on track to deliver record revenues for the fourth quarter. With that said, let's turn to our BMW SOP. In the early weeks of the third quarter, we moved forward on a very important milestone in our company's history, moving into SOP with our BMW Gen 1 program. The components are shipped to Magna for final assembly at the plant in Michigan and then head to BMW for installation on the 7 Series. And as I mentioned earlier, we also locked in the final SOP-ready version of our AI-enabled perception software and shipped it on time to BMW as well. We've been pointing to the back half of 23 launch for a while. So to get to this phase is a huge win. And I believe we are building a track record of credibility that includes delivering on our goals and timelines. I mentioned this on the last call, but we still get a lot of questions from investors on BMW plan for lighter and level three driving. BMW blog did a wonderful article and video in August summarizing BMW Group's plan for the Level 3 7 Series. In the video, you can see the car driving seamlessly through a variety of scenarios and hear more about BMW's plans and timeline for deploying the technology. If you haven't watched it yet, I encourage you to go to bmwblog.com or search for it on YouTube. As we go through the rest of the year, I'm sure you'll, you will continue to hear more details about BMW's strategy for automated driving. I also suspect you will see a growing amount of media coverage on the vehicles, particularly as they start to arrive in dealerships and get on the road. We continue to expect vehicles on the road later this year. We will also be amplifying this huge milestone on our end, particularly at CES where we plan to have a version of the library enabled seven years at our own booth. If you're going to be in Las Vegas for the show, we would love to have you to stop by. While the seven years was always planned to be our initial flagship launch for the Innovis One, we've said in the past that our technology was certified on several models and variants within the BMW group, and our efforts are now shifting towards integration with additional models. 
We hope to be able to update you with more developments of this topic in the coming quarters. Needless to say, moving forward on this important program is a source of a great pride at Innovis, not only internally, but also externally. It sends a strong signal to other OEMs that we, we can reach SOP and hit our goals on end milestones. It also further differentiates us from our competition. There are a number of other LiDAR companies out there claiming to compete with us in the automotive LiDAR space, but some don't have even a single series production award yet. And some have awards, but have yet to execute on SOP-related milestones. From our experience, those who haven't executed on these milestones don't even know how much they don't know at this point. And as we transition from SOP preparation to steady state manufacturing, it frees up a lot of bandwidth, both physically and mentally, enabling us to concentrate even more of our efforts on winning next round of business that are currently in our RFI and RFQ pipeline. The other program that is moving into SOP is our shutter program. As a reminder, this is a full level four program. The customer is a leading automotive supplier who is building this vehicle directly in order to become an early leader in the rapidly growing autonomous shuttle market. We expect this program to be fully driverless electric vehicle capable of carrying over 20 passengers and the ability to operate 24 hours a day. The earliest applications are likely to be people movers in environments like airports, college campuses, private communities and corporate campuses. But the shuttle is also expected to be capable of operating in mixed traffic and dedicated lanes. This opens it up to urban centers and possibly even suburban environments where it could become a lower cost or much more flexible alternative to legacy public transportation models. The public transportation operating model has barely changed since the move to from trolley and cable cars to buses nearly 100 years ago. This is the end market, an end market that we believe is primed for disruption through automation. In the initial stages, the shutters can complement existing bus and train transportation systems, possibly linking different modes of transportation together or connecting otherwise uneconomical routes. Over time, it's not hard to imagine the autonomous routes increasingly dislocating the legacy routes as adoption grows. This secular growth opportunity could also extend to the other level four program that we are working on, the light commercial vehicle program that we, meant, that we announced during the first quarter. That program remains on track for a mid-decade SOP with a healthy growth in samples between now and then. Another thing to keep in mind with these level four programs is that they utilize multiple LiDAR units. Most level four typically deploy anywhere between three to six LiDARs per vehicle. In fact, the shuttle program that we're SOPing later this year initially planned to four, four lighters per vehicle, one in each corner of the shuttle, but they have since moved to a six lighter design after incorporating two additional units of, on the sides with a, a wider field of view. Not only does this increase the dollar content per vehicle, but it also shows the flexibility of what our lighter are able to bring to the table, ranging from ultra long range forward facing lighter to wide field of view, mounted lighter and anything in between with only a minimal change to our hardware or software. And while we're on the topic of growing content per vehicle, I wanted to offer a little more color on the second generation program that we are de developing for BMW. Last quarter, we showed that we have begun development of an all new second generation platform that is built around Innovis 2 sensor and our AI enabled perception software stack. We also spoke in detail about how we have the potential to meaningfully grow our software content and dollar value. In this quarter, I wanted to give you a little bit more color on what, we want, what the overall change in the content per vehicle could look like. A key part of our long-term strategy is to drive the price of the LiDAR sensor lower in order to drive adoption rates higher, tailwinds from potentially rapid increases in volumes as we move up the S-curve have the, potentially, uh, the opportunity to be a meaningfully positive net computed, contributor to both the revenue and profit line. But as we drive sensor costs lower, our goal is to continue to drive content per vehicle higher by expanding into new product cat categories. To articulate this point, I think it would be helpful to compare how our business model in CPV has evolved over time. In the first generation program with BMW, we were operating as a tier two supplier selling only components to Magna, not, not a full liar to BMW. 
Magna takes those components, integrates them into other parts of the hardware, and then sells and finish and the finished LiDAR to BMW. We were only capturing a portion of the total system value, around $600 to $700 per vehicle. Since winning that contract in 2018, we've undergone two transformative changes. First, we transitioned from a tier two supplier to a tier one, capturing a much larger portion of the economics and moving from selling components to selling full systems. This moves also increases the amount of non-recurring re engineering or NREs revenues available to us. The second transition was moving from InnoVis 1 to InnoVis 2. Thanks to several technological and engineering breakthroughs, we moved from a design that was built on four lasers and four detectors to a design built on a single laser, single detector. This, along with the host of other changes, resulted in a bill of material, BOM, that was roughly 70% lower than InnoVis 1. This was a massive reduction in cost, and these changes were a key catalyst for our Tier 1 design win. With Volkswagen in 2022, and the, the big acceleration in commercial activity we have seen since then. Despite the 70% reduction in material costs, we've still be, we were still able to grow the total content per vehicle into the $500 to $1,000 range, thanks to our pivot being to being a tier one, which enabled us to capture the full system value. Looking forward, we believe we can use the Gen 2 system that we are developing as a potential template for future programs. Here, we would continue to leverage the 70% lower bomb of the InnoVis 2 to drive higher LiDAR adoption, while pairing it, pairing it with a higher value and more robust version of our perception software and all new products like the InnoVis Core AI compute model and the minimum risk maneuver software. By providing more value and functionality to customers, we believe we can set, we can get CPV nicely over the $1,000 mark while also increasing our mix of higher margin software revenue. We are very focused on making this template for future customers. Next, I want to give a, a quick update on Volkswagen. Overall, our program with VW continues to progress nicely, and the sensor suite for the initial program continues to evolve. We moved from the A sample to the B sample back in March, and we continue to test and fine tune within the B sample stage, having released our new B2, sampled during this quarter. Each new version unlocks incremental levels of performance, functionality, industrialization, and the newest version is based on our second generation custom ASIC. Last quarter, we shared with you that we have finished the tape out of the ASIC. The new chip has two key benefits. The first is that it unlocks conf a configuration that enables much more range. Taking our maximum detection range, de detection from uh, 300 meters to 450. And the second is that it can support much higher resolution. The more powerful chip enables us to produce millions of more points. In fact, we were able to nearly double the total number of points that we can process per second. This can power a high den higher density point cloud with even better resolution than before. Continuous improvement like, like this in, in both our sensor and software suite are adding our conversations with OEMs, with Volkswagen specifically, we are in advanced conversations exploring the, pot the potential addition of multiple platforms that would be incremental to our initial series production award. We hope to have more to share on this in the coming quarters. But as I always say, video speaks better than words. I'm excited to share with you some of the early point cloud footage from the new ASIC. Last quarter, when I shared the update, we said that we hope to get the close to high definition, camera-like levels of resolution with the added benefits of true 3D dimensional LiDAR-based map. As you can see in the video, we're essentially there. There is still, and this is still an early version of the point cloud. We're confident that it will only continue to improve from, from here. We are working quickly to bring this new level of functionality into the hands of our customers and prospects. Customer interest has been strong and Innovis 2 shipments were 102% up, quarter over quarter in the third quarter. Keep in mind, the benefits aren't just in the sensor side, the dramatically higher range and resolution translates into more points of data. That data fuels our AI tools, including the neural networks that are a critical part of our software development. 
Faster neural networks training translates into better perception software, and better perception software unlock new features like enabling vehicles to travel at higher speed or operate in more complex environments. Continuous environment improvements like this in both our sensor and software suite are a big part of why we are seeing so much commercial momentum, including in our RFI and RFQ pipeline. As a reminder, we had a record number of programs move from the RFI to the RFQ process in the first quarter of 23. And now over half of the 10 to 15 programs in the pipeline are in the RFQ stage. There are big differences between the RFI request for information and an RFQ request for quotation. An RFI is much less structured process and we've seen some programs remain in the RFI stage for over two years, whereas others have transitioned to the RFQ in less than six months. At the RFI stage, OEMs may just be testing systems, performing R&D activities, collecting data. Typically, the programs are working towards a production launch, but they don't move into the RFQ stage until, until a clear decision to go forward with the program has been made. At that point, the OEM has typically fully decided that the, the vehicle is going to serious production, committed to a timeline for production, and has decided the vehicle will include the LiDAR. The OEM dedicates costly resources to the program, including entire engineering, supply chain finance, and, pro and product management teams. This represents a meaningful investment from the OEM, and it's much more tangible signal of a commitment to the program. The step up in the RFQs that we've seen in 23 appears to be a strong signal that the LiDAR industry is maturing, <clears throat> is maturing and the level three autonomy megatrend is beginning. We believe it is solid evidence that OEMs are increasingly in a race to deploy the technology. Failure to, to stay ahead of the curve, particularly for luxury brands, runs the risk of potentially competitive irrelevancy and resulting market share losses and could do long-term damage to a brand. It also runs the risk of missing an important source of profit and the transition to recurring revenues for OEMs. Missing the opportunity to deploy must-have consumer tech like level three autonomy may not only result in, result in lost volumes and market share, but it could also translate into lost profit dollars on advanced features. Many of the OEMs that we talk to are looking for opportunities to, call, to grow the recurrent revenue streams with vehicles lasting increasingly longer and with EVs potentially driving that trend even further. It seems that the OEMs are hungry for opportunities to complement their one-time sale with recurrent revenues. The industry has had some success with products like telematics and connectivity, but in my opinion, the single best opportunity for recurrent revenues lies in, in monthly subscription for autonomous driving packages and the ongoing over-the-air software that will underpin them in the future of software-defined vehicles. I believe this has been part of the driving force behind multiple OEMs pivoting from RFIs to RFQs more or less at the same time. I think there is a growing fear of missing the, this opportunity, this potentially massive megatrend. Basically, it's corporate form. In fact, if you look at our RFQs, the majority of the programs are with a top 10 global OEM. This is a lot of shots on goal. We don't need to win them all. We already have BMW and Volkswagen Group as customers, and they collectively represent 15% of global automotive production. We believe that if you can secure just one or two major OEMs as customer, and we will have a substantial lead in what we expect will be a winner takes most market. These programs converted to RFQ at different points and are moving along different timelines. All of the programs have moved on to various phases of audits of the technology, focusing on, on quality, software supply chain and more. The first phase typically revolves around the product itself, focusing on the sensor and software suite. There can often be a point in the middle where two or at most three players are shortlisted and the focus moves away from the technology and more towards the manufacturing strategy and operations. Within the group of RFQs, three of the programs are moving faster and went through the financial audit and certification of high volume manufacturing stage in the early fall. <clears throat> These programs have since moved into the final stage, which includes definitive price negotiations and detailed planning of post-nomination milestones. This was a critical factor behind our capital raise in August. When we look at who, who are we competing against most often in these RFQs, it's not the early stage ladder pure play companies most investors typically assume. Instead, it's the more established tier ones. And while they try to compete on their operating history, we compete on our technology. 
And this is a matchup that we will take all day long. Because we are often told by customers that our technology is better. And we've won against these bigger tier ones before. We've won on BMW, we've won on Volkswagen, based on our technology. And I'm confident that we can do this again and again. With that in mind, we felt it was important to keep any bidding process focused on the technology advantage. That is why we undertook the capital raise. It was successful for us in, as it accomplished three critical things. One, it raised additional $65 million, giving us an even longer cash runway. Two, it, uh, it showed that we have continued support from our largest existing institutional shareholders. And three, it allowed us to move into the final phase of several RFQs. And as a signal of our con confidence, several of us participated in the deal. My fellow co-founder, Oren Buskila, and I both bought stock during the transaction. And our chairman of the board, Amichai Steinberg, made an op open market purchase the week after. We are heavily invested in Innovis alongside you. We are confident that if we win even just one or two of these deals with the help of the capital raise, the long-term outcome will have been worth the short-term volatility. Because when we look at the lighter industry, we believe our next one to two deals have the potential to permanently shape the industry. You've heard me talk about the flywheel effect before. In this industry, we believe that wins will lead to more wins. First of all, this is a safety critical technology. And each time an OEM chooses us as a partner, it can send a message of confidence to other OEMs and make it easier to choose Innovis. There can be a tremendous amount of signal value in every win. Second, we've already had serious production awards with two out of three main autonomy platform providers, as we are quoting an RFQ right now with the third. Being already integrated into the platform software makes it less costly and less risky to choose us as the lighter vendor, and it can speed up the OEM time to market. And third, more wins translates into higher volumes, leading to more purchasing power and lower unit, co unit cost. In fact, I think you can already see some of the early proof of the flywheel effect in motion for us. After winning BMW in 2018, it took us over three years to win our next production award. From there, it took us a full year to announce the next one. You can see the pace of the activity has clearly accelerated in the past year. And if we can finalize this advanced stage RFQs, it will offer even more evidence that the flywheel effect is working in our favor. Turning to our 2023 targets, we have raised portions of our guidance twice year to date. In the first quarter, we raised the high end of the range of our target for additional programs for existing customers following our announcement of the light commercial vehicle. And in the second quarter, we raised our revenue guidance following increased visibility into higher volumes and NRE revenues. We also took the upper end of the net new NRE booking range higher following progress we are still seeing in our RFQ pipeline coupled with the scope of the NRE awards being quoted on the programs that are pro progressing the fastest. Today, we are reiterating our targets, including guidance for 2023 revenue of 15 to $20 million, which represents year-over-year -year line growth of 150 to 230%. Coming into the year, we flagged that the revenue would drop in the first quarter as our BMW program pricing transitioned from sample pricing to production pricing which was more of a 10x decline in our initial ASPs, but would be an offset by higher volumes in the later quarters. Following that reset in pricing, we said revenues would grow meaningfully quarter over quarter, particularly in the back half of the year, as we approach SOP and unlock NRE revenues. Revenue proceeds to grow 45% sequentially in the second quarter, and we were followed by an even stronger 138% quarter over quarter in the third quarter. If you consider our 15 to $20 million revenue target range and subtract year-to-date revenue of around $6 million, it implies a fourth quarter revenue in the range of $9 to $14 million. At the, at the midpoint, that would represent roughly 230% quarter-over-quarter growth and over 600% year-over-year growth. It has the potential to not only be our largest quarter ever, but larger than any of our prior full year revenue numbers. I say this not only because I'm proud of what we are delivering, but also as a further evidence of us delivering on what we say we are going to do. We said that Q1 was the trough. We delivered two 
quarter of strong sequential growth, and we are now in the process of potentially delivering our largest quarterly revenue number ever. And with that, I will turn the call over to Edom. Thank you, Omer. Good morning, everyone. Starting with cash, we ended Q3 2023 with approximately $164 million in cash, bank deposit, marketable securities, and short-term restricted cash on the balance sheet. With our cost structure being largely matured, our operating cash outlays remain mostly stable during the quarter on a normalized basis. We did defer roughly 2.9 million of R&D expenses as a result of booking NRE revenue. While this drove lower than normal operating expenses in the third quarter, we expect to recognize the deferred expenses in the coming quarter as COGS. At a higher level, on a normalized basis, you can see that our cost structure has been mostly flat since the second half of 2022. The bulk of the growth in our cost structure occurred during our transition from a tier two to a tier one relating to the Volkswagen Group Award in 2022. As we have said before, we, uh, with, the with the transition, uh, Sorry, as we said before, with the transition to a tier one mostly behind us, we do not expect material increase in our cost structure. One of the factors behind this flexibility is our transition to SOP with the Innovis One. As this program transitioned from development stages to high volume manufacturing, it freed up headcount to work on the entire, the entire, the art. Sorry, it freed up headcount to work on either the RFQ pipeline or the Innovis 2 SOP. This gives us meaningful flexibility going forward without the need to significant uh, growth in our fixed costs. Moving to the income statement, revenue in Q3 2023 came in at $3.5 million compared to Q2. 2023 revenues of $1.5 million, delivering a 138% quarter over quarter increase. On a year over year basis, it compares to Q3 2022 revenues, which were impacted by our headquarters move of, uh, move of $0.9 million, delivering growth of nearly 300% year over year. On the cost side, operating expenses for Q3 2023 were $27.8 million, a decrease from $31.3 million in Q3 2022. As I mentioned earlier, Q3 2023 operating expenses saw $2.9 million of R&D expenses deferred into future quarters and will be recognized as COGS to match costs with future NRE revenues. This quarter's operating expenses included $5 million of share-based compensation compared to $4.9 million in Q3 2022. Research and development expenses for Q3 2023 were $20.7 million, a decrease from $24.2 million in Q3 2022. The quarter's R&D expenses included, included $3.1 million attributable to share-based compensation compared to $3.2 million in Q2 2022. In conclusion, we are delivering on the growth cadence that we laid out uh, coming into the year. Q1 2023 was the trough. We delivered a 45% quarter over quarter growth in Q2, 138% uh, in Q3, and have line of sight to another meaningful step up in the fourth quarter. Even more importantly, we are executing on this growth while dealing with record level of RFQ activity. We expect to finish the year on a very strong note with continued uh, momentum for 2024 and beyond. And with that, I will turn the call back to Omar. Thank you, Eldar. Okay. Um, before turning the call over to the Q&A, I wanted to offer a few final remarks. In 2022, we hinted at a major new OEM customer, and months later, we delivered Volkswagen. 
Coming into the year, we said that we're working on a program expansion and we delivered on the light commercial vehicle program in the first quarter and announced development of the second generation system for BMW last quarter. And in the third quarter, we delivered on our BMW SOP timeline while also moving three RFQs past financial and high volume manufacturing audits and into final phases of price negotiation and post-nomination milestone alignment. My team and I spent a lot of time visiting OEMs across Europe, Asia, and North America. The past few months, and in the past few months, and we have several more trips planned before the year end. We will be in Germany next week, taking our new B2 sample with the, with the new custom ASIC to existing customers and new ones and, and prospects. We are very excited about what we achieved, and I want to personally deliver these new samples. We have things that we really want to deliver on for you, that we think we are very close at hand, and we will not. We will work nonstop until we accomplish them. Thank you very much, and uh, we can move to the to the Q and A. Thank you. In order to ask a question, please raise your hand using your mobile or desktop application and wait for your name to be announced. Once again, please raise your hand using your mobile or desktop application and wait for your name to be announced. Our first question comes from the line of Mark Delaney from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for taking my questions. You spoke about having a very active RFI and RFQ pipeline. I'm hoping you can share your latest views on the potential timing for new wins and your confidence in reaching the two new series production awards with new customers this year. Yeah, so uh, as I said uh, in uh, during my, my talk, uh, the team is working uh, intensively on uh, several fronts with different OEMs. Uh, as we speak, we are uh, conducting an audit. We have several audits already in, in this month. Uh, we are expecting uh, at least two of uh, these three customers that we talked about that are in a later stage to make a decision still this year, uh, according to their plans. Uh, so we are um, working towards that. Uh, understood. Thank you, Omer. And then my other question was around the shuttle program and hoping to better understand how that's developing. Y you, you mentioned uh, more lighters now being used and you know, with them making that change and also being relatively close to the start of production. Can you help us understand if that is going to impact either the timing or magnitude of the ramp? And, and also, could you clarify if the additional lidars that will be used, are those definitively going to Innovis or is that something that's still being evaluated by the customer? Um, so possibly I did not describe it uh, right. It, it, this is a decision made uh, more than uh, six months ago, or maybe more than that. Uh, we were just uh, reflecting the fact that uh, several that every uh, level four program uses more than one lidar, and that was an example of a program that initially started with four, but later became six, but some time ago. Uh, so that not uh, it's it's obviously it's an innovative lidar, not uh, anyone else. Uh, and it's not uh, affecting the timeline. Uh, understood. I'll, I'll pass it along. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Andres Shepard from Cantor. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Let's... Thank you. And uh, congrats on... Uh, uh, the quarter and all of the um, developments and congrats on the uh, SOP being finally here. Um, wanted to maybe just ask, um, you know, how should we be thinking about that uh, BMW contract continuing to, to ramp up as we head into next year? You know, you provided revenue guidance for Q4, which is very helpful. Just kind of curious if maybe you can give us a little bit more color as to how and what we should expect uh, into 2024. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start and probably let the LDA, uh, take the lead later. Uh, BMW is currently launching with the i7. Uh, the initial uh, volume uh, would start in a moderate uh, manner. We do expect another model to be launching uh, next year. That's, that's the plan right now. 
uh, in terms of uh, guidance, I'm not sure that uh, we are providing such <laughs> right now. We definitely will uh, provide guidance uh, going forward, but uh, we, we do, uh, we are hopeful based on the pipeline that we see that uh, we will have uh, a growing uh, revenue cadence going forward as well. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and maybe, um, can you give us a sense on, you know, around gross margins? There was a pretty significant improvement uh, in this quarter, you know, as evidenced by the the BMW contract uh, ramping up. I any sense on kind of how we should continue to think about gross margins for next quarter and again into next year? You know, I don't, I know you're not providing guidance, but would you expect those to continue to gradually improve quarter over quarter or what's the best way to think about that thank you so so uh, obviously as we get uh, to production volumes and as the uh, products mature we are expecting that the gross margin due to these factors on, on the production for uh, and the sales of ligers will improve this is one factor that uh, comes into play uh, and the second factor which is also very important Important and dominant uh, is uh, the NRE recognition. As we uh, gain more and more in NRE and are able to recognize more and more NRE, and this will be an important factor both for this year and next year, uh, we will see that a uh, positive impact on our gross mars margins. Uh, very helpful, Eldar. Thank you. And just maybe if I could squeeze in one last one. Um, with the uh, 164 million now in cash and equivalents, just remind me what is the expected run rate with that cash on hand, sir? Or... So, so uh, if, as you said, we have a strong balance sheet. We just uh, uh, in August we raised uh, additional funding to have this strong balance sheet. In addition, this, this balance sheet, you know, if uh, you take it linearly, uh, brings us well, uh, well into 2025. Uh, in addition, we are, have growing revenues, uh, which will balance off some of the expenses. We are expecting to win additional programs. As we said before, our, our pipeline, our current pipeline is over $150 million potential in NRE. So once we win the, these additional programs, this means additional uh, NREs, and this brings us far and beyond to where we need. Thanks again, guys, and congrats on the quarter. I'll pass it Thank on. You. Our next question comes from the line of Kevin Cassidy from Rosenblatt Securities. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks for taking my question, and congratulations on the great progress. Um, this the uh, the number of uh, RFQs that you're working on now, and if you uh, close on two of those, the other ones are still in play. As we get into 2024, they're just being delayed. Uh, can you maybe just maybe give a timeline on some of the other programs? Um, so we said that uh, we expect um, some to make a decision this year. I think that by the progress we're seeing. Uh, with the other RFQs, uh, I would say they are split between the, maybe the first quarter and the second quarter. Also taking into account the timeline in which they plan to launch. So uh, I would expect that uh, it will not uh, take longer than that, but uh, that's how I see it right now. Okay, uh, great. And maybe uh, just so to understand a little more with, with the... Uh... Six lidars being controlled by the uh, perception software. How? What? Is there a maximum number of lidar the you know, software can handle? <laughs> uh, it's not about the software. It's about the compute platform that eventually needs to process uh, the the point cloud, uh, which of course, as you increase the 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 point density and frame rate, you you require a stronger compute. Uh, uh, platforms. Uh, but I can also share that uh, one of the things that uh, the team has uh, substantially improved between the first generation and the second generation is also uh, the architecture. 
in which they are performing their uh, algorithms. You know, Innovis 1, uh, the transition from Innovis 1 to Innovis 2 was quite meaningful. We were able to improve the performance by more than 30 times, and we were able to reduce the cost by 70%. Obviously, once you improve uh, the density so significantly, you need to take into account that uh, the compute that cannot improve by that uh, factor. So, of course, you do need to take, uh, I would say, almost a revolutionary uh, step. Uh, and I think many of the learnings that the team had uh, during the first program when we developed the perception software for BMW was very much about understanding the, I would say, the, the boundaries and how we can uh, significantly optimize it. Um, so we are, you know, eventually the, the number of platforms that are used by our customers are not many. There are primarily two or three main platforms that everyone is using. Either it's NVIDIA or Mobileye or uh, Qualcomm, um, maybe also Renesas. So we are very familiar with all of these platforms. Some of our work with these platform players is, is not in order to learn about their hardware accelerators so we can uh, make use of them as best as possible so we can we don't need to exhaust the the power consumption and the processing power so uh, i would say it's part of the reason why a company that is developing a lidar needs to have its hand very much involved in the software development i think that doing that in a split between different vendors uh, the outcome would very likely not be uh, very, very good. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Um, and just one other question as we, you know, you look at the competitive landscape and, you know, we've been talking about this market's going to consolidate and um, the, are there assets out there that would help Innovis or, um, you know, is there any uh, plan where, you know, your competitors start falling off the pace that maybe you can pick up some uh, some uh, assets to help you move forward? So, I mean, of course, when uh, we are aware of the different companies in the space, and I would say that the motivation for Innovis is to possibly look on the assets that are done by others, if we will feel that there is a complementary solution that we are missing. Uh, so far, since our focus is primarily automotive and winning those RFQs, I don't see a, a gap in, in our offering, uh, but we continue to uh, to look on the different uh, counterparts. And but so far, I, I don't see a good uh, fit. Okay, thanks. Uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Our next questions come, question comes from the line of Kevin Garrigan from West Park Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hey, Omer and Elder. Thanks for taking my questions. Let me echo my congrats on the progress. Um, going back to, to Mark's question regarding hitting your targets this year, and you, you know you're in the final stages of these RFQs and just kind of waiting at this point in time. Just kind of wondering, you know, if if these decisions don't get made in the next few months, what would be a, a potential cause for a delay? I mean, you know, would would EV programs not working out for some companies cause a delay at all, or you know, something that you might have seen with Volvo where the software doesn't develop? Oh no, it's uh, maybe to explain what are the complexities related to an RFQ and what uh, might cause a delay. You need to understand that once you get the nomination. Eventually, you need to start execute on a plan that was uh, aligned between both sides. This means that the plan needs to consider everything that needs to happen from nomination to SOP. So you can imagine that the amount of details that need to be decided and aligned between the two sides is quite meaningful. Uh, the, the integration of the sensor into the car, including the connectivity, the software, thermal um, uh, interfaces, and, and et cetera, really the, the amount of details that are needed to be considered uh, when taking that plan into account are, are many. And it is important to align on everything because once the car maker is choosing a supplier, uh, they basically cannot change anything in the plan. Otherwise, it drives 
uh, change requests that are quite expensive usually to the OEM. So the, the, the RFQ process, while they are auditing the, the supplier, part of the process is also to get to a clear alignment between both sides and all of the details. And that takes sometimes uh, a lot of time because it uh, also requires some uh, things are uh, become more clear to the OEM on things that he needs to do and take into account. And, and sometimes he's not aware of it. And sometimes it takes for them uh, a more uh, holistic view and talk with other parts of the vehicle uh, car uh, teams. But generally, uh, even if a decision is uh, pushed, it's uh, mostly technical. And uh, even if it's not uh, done in uh, one quarter, then maybe it's uh, done in the second quarter. It doesn't uh, necessarily, and, and by the way, they usually when they change the RFQ timing, they, they don't change uh, the SOP time. So it adds pressure to all sides. I wouldn't uh, consider a, a push of an RFQ decision as a, as a meaningful element in the, in the industry, I would say. Okay, got it, got it. That makes sense. Um, and then I know you have a, a strong relationship with the, the ADAS Compute platform companies, Qualcomm, Mobileye, NVIDIA. How have, how have these partnerships been beneficial, if at all, in, in helping with potentially capturing some of your shots on goal? So every program that we're competing on, uh, we are trying to understand which platform they target to use. Sometimes they already know, sometimes they are still assessing. Uh, these are important uh, details because uh, on the RFQ process, as I said, a big part of the RFQ is aligning on the on the tasks and, uh, and, and the costs that are involved also related to those tasks. When we show that uh, we are already uh, doing some of those tasks, we on one side we lower the risk related to potentially integration risks and we shorten obviously the timeline. But in some cases, we can also share uh, share costs of these activities with the OEM and overall providing them a better NRE offering. Um, so right now, we are already working with two out of those three that you mentioned. And uh, with some of the OEMs that we are competing, uh, these are the planned platforms. This is also, by the way, this is also the motivation of the platform player. Uh, talking with uh, the head of uh, one of them was clear. He, he made it very clear to me that their motivation is similar. Um, one, one of the things that a, a platform for a player is providing is uh, it's called HIL, hardware in the loop, which means that it's a full hardware emulation of the entire platform. It's a very costly uh, setup and uh, takes uh, time and money. And their motivation of using the same sensor on different platforms is, is high. So I think it's uh, mutually uh, beneficial for uh, us and the platform player uh, that other OEMs uh, would use the same sensor. Uh, we said also that uh, we're currently uh, working with the third towards an, an RFQ decision. And I believe we have a good uh, chance in, in getting it. Okay, perfect. I appreciate the color. Congrats again on the progress. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Sure. There are no further questions. Thank you for your participation. This concludes our call today. You may now disconnect.